cast my mind to Calvary when Jesus fled and died for me I see his hands his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body The disciples and the followers of Jesus wondered what was next. For three days, there was sorrow in their lives. There was sadness in their lives as they wondered what was next now that their teacher, their rabbi, the one they had followed day in and day out, who had taught them and shown them God's love, it was now gone. And then that third day came. And, and in that moment, in a, in a moment in time that changed the world forever, in, in a moment that was orchestrated since the beginning of time, the stone was rolled away. And as they looked in, they said, he is not here for he has risen. And as we celebrate that today, we recognize that there is freedom in this story. There is restoration and redemption in this story. That because Christ died and rose again, that the world can be free. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Because only victory now comes to everyone through the saving grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is what we celebrate today. So praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Oh, praise the name. Oh, 
Come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. The taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The resurrection of Jesus proved once and for all that He is the Son of God, that He had conquered death and sin and has the power to save. And when He was raised to new life, He made a way for us to be raised into new life, a life of hope and joy and freedom from all the sin that entangles. So bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with all
is risen. Amen. Ah, it is good to be here on Resurrection Sunday. Who's happy to be here this morning? What a wonderful celebration. If you're watching online, we are so glad that you've tuned in and are participating with us. Before you are seated, would you turn around and remind someone that Jesus is alive and get to know their name if you don't know their name. If you're watching online, let us know where you're watching from. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church today. It is so good to be together today. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. He is risen. You're so good at that. Hey, my name is Cliff. I serve as one of the pastors here. And uh, just want to issue you, especially if you're here for the first time or you haven't been here, here in a while, just a special welcome. I would encourage you, uh, if you want to get more information about the various things that are happening here at Sunrise, please feel free to stop by our information counter that's out there in the lobby. And uh, they have a gift bag for you with a special treat in there and, uh, and information about the church. And if you're online, just go to to sunrise.church slash welcome and let us know that you were here. Um, also let us know how we can be praying for you if you're here uh, in the room this morning. We have prayer cards that are right there in the seat backs in front of you. Please feel free to fill those out and turn them in. We would love to be able to be praying for you in the coming week. Um, I just have a couple of quick announcements today. I want to remind you all that coming up this Friday evening in this room is our Hume Lake fundraiser banquet. And uh, the, the people that are applauding are the ones that are going, Whew. Hume Lake costs, it costs a lot to get there, and it is. I am so glad that there are people that are going to be helping with that. Um, the truth is, camp costs a lot, but the uh, bigger truth is... Uh, the things that happen at camp are foundational in our students' lives and in our ministry, and uh, it is worth every penny to get our kids up there uh, to hear the gospel and to be challenged to live every day for the Lord. So we would encourage you, stop by the booth that's right there. As you go out, there's a table just immediately on your left as you go out these doors, and you can purchase tickets for the banquet that is this Friday night. Uh, and then the other announcement I have is, if you are fairly new to Sunrise and you wanna just learn more about who we are, uh, some of the various things uh, that we do and get a lot deeper and even potentially move towards membership. Uh, we have a Life at Sunrise membership class that is coming up April 30th and May 7th. Uh, so it's over two weeks. It's during this service. Uh, happens upstairs. You can sign up for that online. We'd love for you to, uh, to check us out a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward right now. We're going to continue our service with a time of giving together. And uh, if you're online, you can always go to sunrise.church slash give to be able to give online electronically or through our app. And um, we're going to pray. Let's do that together. Oh, Father, it is so good to be here on Resurrection Sunday to celebrate the amazing um, miracle of you coming out of, of, of Jesus, you coming out of that grave, alive, resurrected, and, and with that, the salvation for us and the hope in that resurrection that we have. And so we praise you for that, Father. We celebrate it today and we give today uh, with the joy that we want others to know um, of what your salvation is like. And uh, so, Father, we commit uh, this giving to you. We commit this service to you. Uh, may it be pleasing and honorable to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Salvation in the name of Jesus, our living home. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Caught in traffic. All right. Good morning and welcome to Sunrise. Uh, for those of you who are new here, a uh, very special welcome. If you're visiting and in town and and staying here, we are glad that you are joining us. Uh, if you are new here, uh, I'm, my name is Luke Miller. I am the senior pastor here. I'm not just the Easter morning hype man from earlier. Uh, it is, I actually have a job here. And so I'm just glad you're here. And obviously Easter Sunday is such a fun Sunday. And which is 
For those of you who were here on Good Friday and, and celebrated and, and remembered Good Friday, it, it's such a, a dichotomy between the two, right? You just go away from Good Friday and there's reflection. And I mean, we know how the story ends. And, and yet at the same time, you can't help but take in the, the full the fullness of everything that happens over this short little time span of really just a couple weeks from, from Palm Sunday to the Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus, and, and then him rising again. And, and so it is really this, this emotional roller coaster. And, and this is for us who know the end of this story. I, I can't imagine what the disciples and his followers and, and those who had been living life with Jesus had, had gone through. And, and yet, in today, we celebrate the victory and the freedom that can be had because Christ has risen uh, from the dead. And we are, I am excited for this. I, as we get into, uh, get into it this morning, I think, uh, first of all, you, if you've got your Bibles, you can go to Colossians chapter 3. That's right. Uh, we are... We are in Colossians. We've been going through a series in Colossians. And there's a reason why we've been going through this and why we find ourselves on Easter taking a look at chapter 3, which is all about the supremacy of Christ and who Christ is in our lives. Now, when we last left off on Good Friday, I, I talked a little bit about how these different events happened. And one of them was the, the temple curtain being torn in two. And, and here you have this 30 foot by 60 foot curtain that was two inches thick, took 300 priests to just hang it up when it, when it went up. And this was huge and it was torn into, and there's a symbolism that now this, this message that we hear that for God so loved the world, that, that at, we put that emphasis on the world there because all of a sudden the world had access we see in the, that in the symbolism and, and we celebrate that and this morning as we we look at the at who Christ is we celebrate the fact that every person who knows Jesus every person has the ability to know Jesus personally to believe in him has access to him will have their sins forgiven and will have eternal life now this is also another Sunday where there's another event happening. For those of you golfers out there, you are probably watching right now. And so, so let me just say that I don't want to know any of the scores, but today is the last day of the Masters. Now, the Masters is a tournament that is a tradition like no other. It is, it is, it's got, it's steeped in tradition. If you want tickets to the Masters, you have to put in for a lottery. And if you put your name into, for the lottery, I want to say that's the first thing I did when I got a social security number uh, when I came, to, came here. Is the pro, I, all right, I got it. It's the first question they ask. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. I'm going. And people will be in there for 20, 25 years and never get their name pulled. Even as you drive by the entrance to Augusta National, it's not this big entrance of grandeur. It's just a little bronze plaque that says Augusta National. And yet, there are people who will not ever be able to get in those doors. There are, there are people who can go whenever they want. Those are called PGA professionals. And then there are those like our, the rest of us who we may never get to go. And, and for some of you out there, for most of you out there, you're like, well, I don't need to go. You know, I go to Disneyland or I go whatever. And, but for the golfers out there, I think it's the only golf course that when I would step foot on the golf course, I'd just start openly weeping. Uh, <laughs> The golfers get this. Yeah, the rest of you may not, so I'll, I'll bring it back home here. But there's this picture that this is only accessible by a few, only accessible if your name is drawn, if you just have that ability to go, and you may only get to go for a few days. As we read our passage in Colossians today, it's all about recognizing that everybody has access to Christ. And, and we celebrate that, as like I said, and, and as I read through Colossians chapter 3, we'll read verses 1 through 11, I want you to keep that in mind, that this is this picture of because Christ died. Because Christ died and rose. And we, that is the statement that, is, that I want us to reson, want to resonate with each and every one of us, because our answer may be a little different for each and every one of us. Because Christ died and rose, I can, and you fill in that blank, whatever it may be. But we recognize that we are in Christ if you are a believer. 
So let me read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to, to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things, anger and rage and malice and slander and, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile, no Jew, no circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. That right there is what we celebrate. Okay, so, so we're here celebrating that Christ is risen from the dead. And notice the very first verse that we read in chapter 3 is, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. You, if you say, I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I believe that he died, and I believe that he rose again, then immediately you are in this group. Then you have been raised with Christ. And now, though, comes a challenge. Of what next, right? And, and, and what our lives start to look like. That, that decision is one that will change your life forever and has changed lives, uh, millions of lives all around the world over centuries because of their belief in Jesus. But then we ask that question of what next? And I think this is, I know this is what Paul talks about. He goes from this doctrine of understanding what it means to believe in Jesus to what does our conduct look like? What do our lives look like? Jesus is supreme over everything, his church. And now we see in the, the chapters that are coming, especially chapter three, there's practical implications for how we live. Now, when, when Sarah and I got engaged and I spent all this time planning this engagement, and in fact, she was kind of angry at me that weekend uh, because I had, I had to find a way to get her out to Banff. That's where I was going to ask her and, and was going to be at the top of this mountain, at the top of the gondola uh, up there. And, and I had this great plan, but we were in Saskatchewan, so I had to find to get her all the way out there. So what do you do to a, uh, when you're a d couple that's dating at a Bible college and she doesn't want to go out hiking in the mountains, but how do you get her out to the mountains? I'll tell you what. You tell her, why don't we go ring shopping? Right? And immediately, I mean, we must have, I must have tried to convince her for three days to try and get in the car to get to Banff. But the moment I said ring shopping, boom, the, she was in, the seatbelt was on, she was ready to go. I didn't have to say anything else. And then we went out there, and for all these days, I, I mean, spoiler alert in this story is I had had the ring for about six months. And, and, and so when we went out there, she was kind of angry, like, when are we doing this ring shop? And we've been up in the mountains, we're doing hiking, and all of these things. And, and finally, we get up to the top and, of this mountain. And all of a sudden, she reckoned, we get up there, and all of a sudden, this moment happens, right? And I ask her to marry me. She said yes. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and then I was like, all right, woo, I did it. I'm done. I did what I was supposed to do, right? And then comes the planning. So much planning. <laughs> now, she would pro one day she might tell you the other side of the story of how much I was involved in the planning. I think I was fairly involved. She will tell a different story. But, uh, and I will just say, before I even get, move on from this, is that there is a slight blessing in being colorblind and having to plan for your wedding. I'll just say it. Oh, what do you think of these colors? They're great. You know, you, I, you want me to choose the colors as a colorblind person? I will gladly do that. I'm gonna... Right? So this is what is happening here in this passage. Is, is so Paul is writing this church, and as he's writing them, he says, he says to them, you've made this decision. 
But now here comes the planning. Here comes the living out part, which is so tough. Now, what is happening here is Paul's reminding us is that in this day, there were all sorts of pagan religions in the world of, of the early New Testament church. And a lot of them taught little or nothing about personal morality. A worshiper could go bow down before an idol, put an offering on the altar, and then go back to the same old sin life. They could do whatever they were doing and then just walk away and be totally fine with it and, and continue on with their everyday life. And what Paul focuses on here is saying, well, wait, there's, there's more than what this is. There's more than what the world is living in this moment. He's been arguing that we are set free from the powers around us and the things that bind us and the burdens we have because of Jesus Christ. But now he tells us that we have been set free for living a life above moral reproach. God's plan is to first make us new and then he challenges us to live as new people. That's, I think, where we often wrestle with. I know that's something that I often wrestle with too is, right? Okay, so we have been set free. So how do we live a life to live as, as new people. We don't have to be like we've always been. We can break free from the past. For those of you who are here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your, uh, as your Lord and Savior, you understand that if there are burdens in your life, if there's sin in your life, that you do not have to live a life carrying those burdens, that you can break free from the past, you can break free from what is going on in your life if you know where to look. Now, the opening phrase, I think we know where to look, and it, this next part of the passage tells us exactly that, is that we need to first set our sights on things above. We need to, to look up, if you will, since, since you died with Christ. And, and Paul writes this, set your heart on things above. I love this. And I'm sure you've heard this You've heard this before, and while I take a look at this, if we truly set our hearts on things above, we will experience the power and freedom here on earth. The more we focus on Christ and, and focus on the freedom that we have through him is the more that we can experience that freedom as we live out our daily lives, no matter what the circumstances are. And that word set means to seek something out with a desire to possess it. It's that, that start of the journey knowing that there is a goal in mind, that you have this ultimate desire to possess it. And when it comes to something like freedom and everlasting freedom or experiencing uh, the love of God, to experience forgiveness, to experience a release from those burdens that you may have, you understand that this is a goal worth pursuing. This is something that you want to possess. The word here is in this present tense, which implies that we will continue to seek things over and over and over and focus our sights on God. If we use that as a foundation, and as Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our focus is on things that will ultimately rust and tarnish and break down and burn up, our energy and our emotions will be misplaced. If we seek out Christ and allow him to become our ultimate treasure, our hearts will follow. See how that decision turns into action? Knowing that Christ is seated at the right hand of God provides a much needed reminder that, that as we've seen in this entire book, that Jesus is supreme and is in control. The phrase echoes Psalm 110, verse 1, which is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. The, the Lord's... The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What this is saying is Jesus is exalted and sits at the right hand of the Father, which shows that his redemptive work is complete. That, that has to mean a lot. I know that that means a lot. The experience of freedom leading to how we live. Verses 3 and 4 actually go even further to say how, what, this, what benefit we can have as we start to focus on Jesus. First, in, in verse 3, it says, we, it looks back to the cross where, where we died positionally in Christ. As a result, we have no obligation to live like we used to live. Because you, have been a, you, because you gave your life to Jesus, you are free. Because you follow him, you are free. Because 
He died and rose again. You are free. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Do you see that picture of the old self and the new self? Uh, of what has happened there? Do you see that throughout this entire passage, it is, it is the picture of old and the picture of new. The way things used to be and the way things can be now and are now. Old and new, back and forth. Our life is hidden with Christ. To have our lives hidden with the one who is seated at the right hand of God gives us both security and satisfaction. It goes beyond just saying there's something new. It says there's security in where you're positioned. It's, there's security in where you are. Christ is our life, it says in verse 4. In a very real sense for, for the believers, Christ is, is what life is all about. And more importantly, as we celebrate Christ rising from the dead, we recognize, as Pastor Cliff mentioned, this is the penultimate moment because there is an ultimate moment coming again, isn't there? We celebrate today and we recognize that Christ rose from the dead, but we also know that he's coming again. We know that he will return and we know that we are in that in that moment, we will rise with him. We know what, what is in store for us. Yet at the same time, there is a world that doesn't. And for those of you who are new to Sunrise, whenever we talk about this, this is something that we absolutely show and, and speak about, which is we know that Jesus is coming again, which means that every part of our life needs to recognize that we need to act with urgency because people die every day without knowing Jesus, without ever being able to experience that freedom, without ever being able to break free of those burdens and experience life in Christ. And so we as a church and we as Christ followers and we as the people of God need to recognize that we act with urgency because Christ is coming again. Nobody knows when, but we know he is coming again for sure, and people need to know his name. We will appear with him in glory, and Paul is urging us to look up and remember who we are now and who we once were. For us, it goes even further, which I think is magnified by saying, be aware of what is around you. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of your context. This is kind of one of those, those parts where I think of the book of Esther and I think so much of, the, of understanding that God has put you in a place this week, wherever you are this month or this year, for such a time as this. Being aware of what is around you and being aware of, of who you can have around you. But you set your hearts on things above, but we also must look out, he says. We must be aware of what's going on in lives. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. There is that, that nature that we have to just go back to the easy way, to go back to the way before. And, and I think we can all experience this. I know we all experience this in all different ways, right? When you become a Christ follower, when you start to stand up for what you believe, all of a sudden... Maybe that road that you thought was going to be easy seems a little harder day to day. The reckon, what, what we recognize here and what Paul recognizes is that, that even when things become difficult, joy is present. Because we recognize that it's, it's part of a much bigger story. Colossians 3.5 uh, reads, So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. I like that translation. Because we have died and we've been raised with Christ, we have the spiritual power to have freedom and to break free of the things that hold us down. You know, last, last week, we talked a lot about legalism and talked a lot about rules. And must, we must refuse to judge using the world's form of judgment. We must reject false authority. We must uh, not focus on just simply the rules but rather live a life that each and every one of us has to live. And, and today we take a look at this even more, that we re Paul says that because of these things, because of these earthly things, the wrath of God is coming. It's not meant to scare, but there is, there's a reality that needs to be told. There's a reality that, that God hates sin. Sin is real. It's not a, a relative thing that say, well, okay, 
you know, I don't think it's a sin, so it's not a sin. The Bible is very black and white on this. It, it's, it's a very clean cut. Sin is real. Forgiveness, though, is real. And, and burdens are real, and freedom is real. And in a more scary sense, hell is real and heaven is real. And that should give us motivation to move forward. He lists off all these things. And I think each and every one of us could probably touch on, on one or two of these things. And, and I, myself included, the things that we are supposed to discard. There's anger, uh, there's rage, there's malice, there's slander, there's, there's bad language, there's lying to one another, and there's behaviors that have no place in the life of, of Christ followers, which is why he challenges us to look inward. And, and verses 9 and 10 do just that. After looking up to God and building our foundations there and looking around in the dangers of this world, we also recognize that we need to rec- look inside and see, has our heart actually gone through a change? This old self and putting on something new. Now, sometimes we don't recognize it because it's just been going on in our life. Once a year, when I was a youth pastor, we would take a group of kids, about 20 or 30 of us, would go out to this place called the Gleaners. And this was a place where um, companies like Campbell's Soup and Sunkiss, when they had extra food, uh, after making all the vegetable soup, they would just donate to this missions organization, and they would, we'd cut up the vegetables, and we would, we'd cut up the vegetables, we'd dry them, and we'd make them into soups, and they would go over to missionaries overseas. And it was a great way for the youth to recognize that, hey, you could be cutting vegetables somewhere, and then it's helping um, the missions all across the world, and orphanages, and people who are sharing the gospel. Now, one year we arrived, and wouldn't you know what else arrived that week? We always wonder, what vegetables are we going to be cutting? And that week, Campbell's Soup had donated 40 tons of onions. Yeah. I know what you're thinking. That's a lot of onions. (laughs) And that's all that was on the agenda for seven days. Cutting onions. And there was two jobs in this. There was the people who would kind of take off that first layer and, and then they would put it in a bucket and send it over to the guy who had this grinder that would dice them up and chop them up and do about 30 onions in about 30 seconds. The poor guy had to wear like scuba gear because he was <laughs> he's still bawling his eyes out. We're, you know, and it was the fun thing for us. You know, whoever was on that, we just, once in a, about every 10 minutes, someone would go over to me like, listen, it's all right, buddy. Just, just cry it out, all right? You, you know, but. So for a week, we're cutting onions. And once in a while, we'd go for ice cream or we'd do something in the afternoon. And you think that everything is normal until you get in a car and you're in a closed environment and everything still is normal. And then you go out into the general public and you realize that there's a whole lot of people standing further away from you. <laughs> and, and, and you're kind of like, you know, what's their deal? And then you start asking and we'd ask, you know, you know do we smell? Except we're asking all the same people who've been hanging out with onions for seven days, do you smell? No, we don't smell. We smell normal. That's where we start to implement, you know, lake visits every day. Uh, and we start to implement where we just, you know. But, but there's, a, like, this is what this is talking about, right? Sometimes we, if we don't look inward, if we don't examine our own lives, sometimes we don't recognize that there's a sin there, that there's a smell there, there's something that we don't want to give up. And, and Paul recognizes this. The churches uh, of the New Testament recognizes this. Like believers over and over throughout the Bible recognize this, that, that sin can creep in. That smell, which we may not recognize, that may not think that is there, is definitely recognizable to others. The picture I'm trying to paint here is that, that when we go out in public or when our job is a, a body and as a church I mean, A, don't smell like onion, but, but two, when you, we're to hold each other accountable because other Christ followers can also see 
when there is that sin in life. That's how we grow stronger. I mean, I think the, the most beautiful thing about this entire passage and the, about this day is the redemptive work of Christ. Is, is the restoration process that takes place in Christ. I mean, you can pick out anybody. You can see how, how in the first pages after the Gospels of a, of a guy who went out and hunted down Christ followers who were spreading the gospel, turned into one of the greatest voices for God and for the saving grace of God in history. As he saw the redemptive work and he experienced the restorative work of Christ. In a moment, in a moment, his life radically changed. We can't forget that. I mean... The redemptive work of Christ is us sitting here today remembering that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And because I know that he died and rose again, I fill in that statement, because Christ died and rose again. He broke me free of, of whatever sin was going on in my life. I mean, I think, I think what I love about this in this passage is that Paul explains that the gospel message is one that is, in verse 11, there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. The word here indicates that in Christ there should be no barriers, no barriers of race, or of education, social standing, wealth, gender, or power. Christ is for everyone. But what do we do with it? You know, the racial distinctions at the time uh, of, of, of this writing, there was the Greek culture that could make a Greek person feel very proud and privileged and therefore look down at the Jewish people and look down at the Christ followers at that time because they had uh, kind of this higher authority. They thought that they were better than everyone else. There are religious distinctions that he mentions uh, here of, of the Jewish people holding on to the ways before they were Christ followers. And there are cultural distinctions here uh, that if you were not a Greek, you were a barbarian. There were economic distinctions. All of these were barriers that were made by people. And that prejudice, those walls that were put up are ones that are broken down when you are new in Christ. Ones that don't exist in the gospel. That the gospel covers all. It's a challenge for each and every one of us to stop looking down, stop searching for something that will never satisfy, and instead look up to Christ, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now this morning you may say, well, okay, well, I know Jesus. And you may be in that group. I know Jesus, and, and I recognize who he is, and, and maybe it's time for us to take a moment to look in and say, you know, does something smell? Is there something going on in my life that, you know, I've given all of it, almost all of it over to Jesus, except this? If that's the case, let the redemptive, restorative work of Jesus work in your life right now. If you are here this morning and you, life is weighing heavy on you, it doesn't matter if you're a Christ follower or not. If you are, if you're here this morning and you are hurting, if there's sorrow, if there's sadness, if there's stuff going on in your life, if it is a job, if it is financial, if it, if it is personal, if it is relational, whatever it is, don't have to walk this road alone. In fact, Colossians chapter 3 is just emphasizing the fact that you are not alone. Not only is there a church body that wants to walk alongside you with that, there are Christ followers that want to help you be free of this. But this whole story, this whole narrative uh, of Jesus is one that you do not have to carry this burden. That you can experience freedom. If you're a Christ follower, it's it's saying, God, I haven't given this over to you. I mean, every, every argument when we had as kids, I remember my dad always saying, all right, what percentage of this is yours? And I mean, you know you wanted to say 100% is not mine. Zero percent of this is mine. But even if you said 1%, you knew what 
was coming next. All right, so you had a part in this. If there's just 1% in your life that you're not giving over to God, are you giving it all? Have you experienced full freedom? For those of you who are here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I can't think of a better place for you to be as we, we hear the story of God loving the world so much that he sent his son for you. Whether you're here this morning, whether you're watching online, you're supposed to be here. Whether where you've been searching for, for love, for hope, for joy in the world and it is fleeting, whether you were hurting and you were just, it just feels like you're, <laughs> you're just trying to grasp onto something. You're trying to keep your head above water. Recognize that there is a, a hand that is stretched out. Once you grab hold, once you believe in Jesus, he's never letting go. Let today be the day that you believe just how true that verse is of God loving you so much that he sent his son for you. We say the world, but let's make it personal and exactly what it is. You just fill your name in there right now. For God loved Luke so much that he gave his one and only son. For God loved Sarah so much that he gave his one and only son. You fill that name in and you recognize the power that then you, when you walk out these doors and you look up to the mountains, you look at the stars in the sky, you see everything in the world that God created. That same power is now walking alongside you as he sent his son for you. And I say that because he's, you put your name in there. Don't go another day without experiencing the fullness of the love of God. Don't go another day with ex without experiencing the, the fullness of the peace of God. Don't go another day without experiencing the, the hope that is everlasting. Let today be the day that you, that you say Jesus is Lord of your life. For each and every one of us. He has risen and we celebrate. He has risen, and this is a day filled with joy, but it is not just recognizing that he has risen. It is saying, now, let's go and tell the world. Those same disciples, those same disciples that were there watching him, watching him being put to death, watching all the circumstances of the previous week, those same disciples ended up going forth and, and starting that New Testament church and seeing hundreds and thousands and millions of lives change by sharing that same story that you've heard about today. And so you, the mission has not changed. In 2,000 years, the mission of God has not changed and the purpose of every Christ follower has not changed. And that is the mission for each and every one of us and the purpose for each and every Christ follower that is here today, that you go and you tell the world with urgency that not only that Christ has risen, that he rose again from the grave for you for this world for whatever individual whatever neighbor whatever family member whatever co-worker whatever student is in your life Jesus came for each and every one that is our mission the purpose has not changed 25 million people came to know Jesus in that first century alone in a in that small area of Asia Minor you don't think that God was going to not work if we go out to this and share with the globe and share with our county, our city, our, our nation, that Jesus is Lord. It is time for us as Christ followers to take back the mantle of what it is to be a Christ follower. We, we want revival, don't we? We want Jesus, the, the banner of Christ uh, to be to be flown over this nation, over this city, over our houses, over our neighborhoods. And it only comes through us going out there and where Christ has put us for such a time as this and share the gospel and live it out. He has risen and because of that, the world needs to know the freedom that they can experience because Jesus is Lord of your lives. So as we sing uh, another song, as we celebrate what Christ has done, do not 
go from here without knowing the purpose that God has given you. Do not go away from here without knowing the mission that God's given you. If you are a Christ follower, then you go and make disciples. You share with the world who he is, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And as we see people come to know Jesus, as you walk out there every single day, I have no doubt from the people in this room that the kingdom of God will grow. And if you are here this morning, I can't stress it enough. Let today be the day that you experience true freedom for the first time and recognize Jesus, Lord of your life. Let me pray. God, you are great. God, this story is great, but it is not done yet. (laughs) You've got so much more in store, and God, we've got so much more work in store. As we go from here, God, we pray that we would have the discernment to know your will, to recognize the power and the authority that you send us out into this world with. That the God of heaven's armies is walking alongside us. The God, the people in this room, as they go from here, would be your workers in the fields, that we would see your kingdom grow. Lord, we know the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. And yet, so we take up that challenge for each and every one of us to do that. And God, if there are people in this room right now who, who are feeling the burden of life, who are fe- feeling heavy laden, who are, are walking with sorrow and strife and, and have not experienced that freedom, God, I pray, pray that today is the day that they know you as their Lord and Savior, that they believe that you died and rose again, that they know that their sins can be forgiven. And I pray for those in this room who are Christ followers, if there's something that they have not given over to God right now, they've not given over to you right now, God, that today would be the day that they would experience that freedom, that fullness of of your love, your hope, your forgiveness in their life so that they could go and build your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you sent your son to die on a cross for us and that we thank you that he rose again. And Lord, we thank you for that promise that we know you are coming again. And so let us go with urgency, knowing that the world needs to know your name and believe in your name. We pray these things in your amazing holy and saving name. Amen. Would you stand and join with us in singing of one song?
We know that there's so much more in store and, and we celebrate in that. But as we go from the knowledge to, to what it means to live out a life as a Christ follower, my prayer is that each and every one of us know that God has put you in a place this week for such a time as this to build his kingdom. If you are new here, please don't forget to stop by the, uh, the info booth and we can, uh, we've got a gift bag for you just sharing, you know, the heart of sunrise and where God is leading us as a church. If you need prayer, if there have been those burdens that you need lifted and you want to give it over to God in prayer and you want someone to pray with you, we have chaplains around this building. We've got a, a prayer area over there and we would love to do We'd love to stop and pray with you at at any moment. If you are here this morning or watching online and and you want to make a decision to follow Jesus or you did make a decision to follow Jesus, please tell somebody. We want to celebrate with you. We want to walk through next steps and what this looks like in your life with you and, and just be a part of that. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And as you go from here, go knowing that the God of heaven's armies is walking alongside you and that your purpose is to go and build his kingdom. Take care. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week, Sunrise.